Part 1 Snowbound A Winter Idol This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Tremblay Snowbound, A Winter Idol by John Greenleaf Whittier The sun, that brief December day, rose cheerless over hills of grey, and, darkly circled, gave at noon a sadder light than waning moon. Slow, tracing down the thickening sky, its mute and ominous prophecy, a portent seeming less than threat, it sank from sight before it set. A chill no coat, however stout, of homespun stuff could quite shut out, a hard, dull bitterness of cold that checked, mid vein, the circling race of lifeblood and the sharpened face, the coming of the snowstorm told. The wind blew east, we heard the roar of ocean on his wintry shore and felt the strong pulse throbbing there beat with low rhythm our inland air. Meanwhile, we did our nightly chores, brought in the wood from out of doors, littered the stalls, and from the mows raked down the herd's grass for the cows, heard the horse whinnying for his corn, and, sharply, clashing horn on horn, impatient down the stanchion rows, the cattle shake their walnut bows, while, peering from his early perch upon the scaffold's pole of birch, the cock his crested helmet bent, and down his querulous challenge sent. Unwarmed by any sunset light, the gray day darkened into night. A night made hoary with the swarm and whirl dance of the blinding storm, as zigzag wavering to and fro, crossed and recrossed the winged snow. And ere the early bedtime came, the white drift piled the window frame. And through the glass the clothesline posts looked in like tall and sheeted ghosts. So all night long the storm roared on. The morning broke without a sun, and tiny spherial traced with lines of nature's geometric signs in starry flake and pellicle. All day the hoary meteor fell, and, when the second morning shone, we looked upon a world unknown, on nothing we could call our own. Around the glistening wonder bent the blue walls of the firmament, no cloud above, no earth below, a universe of sky and snow. The old familiar sights of ours took marvelous shapes. Strange domes and towers rose up where sty or corn crib stood, or garden wall, or belt of wood. A smooth white mound the brush pile showed, a fenceless drift what once was road. The brittle post an old man sat with loose flung coat and high cocked hat. The well curb had a Chinese roof, and even the long sweep, high aloof, in its slant splendor, seemed to tell of Pisa's leaning miracle. A prompt 
decisive man, no breath our father wasted. Boys, a path. Well pleased, for when did farmer boy count such a summons less than joy? Our buskins on our feet we drew, with mittened hands and caps drawn low, to guard our necks and ears from snow. We cut the solid whiteness through, and, where the drift was deepest, made a tunnel, walled and overlaid with dazzling crystal. We had read of rare Aladdin's wondrous cave, and to our own his name we gave. With many a wish the luck were ours, to test his lamp's supernal powers. We reached the barn with merry din, and roused the prison brutes within. The old horse thrust his long head out, and grave with wonder gazed about. The cock his lusty greeting said, and forth his speckled harem led. The oxen lashed their tails, and hooked, and mild reproach of hunger looked. The horned patriarch of the sheep, like Egypt's Ammon, roused from sleep, shook his sage head with gesture mute, and emphasized with stamp of foot. All day the gusty north wind bore the loosening drift its breath before. Low circling round its southern zone, the sun through dazzling snow mist shone. No church bell lent its Christian tone to the savage air. No social smoke curled over woods of snow-hung oak. A solitude made more intense by dreary voiced elements. The shrieking of the mindless wind, the moaning tree boughs swaying blind, and on the glass the unmeaning beat of ghostly fingertips of sleep. Beyond the circle of our hearth, no welcome sound of toil or mirth unbound the spell and testified of human life and thought outside. Reminded that the sharpest ear the buried brooklet could not hear, the music of whose liquid lip had been to us companionship, and in our lonely life had grown to have an almost human tone. As night drew on, and from the crest of wooded knolls that ridged the west, the sun, a snow-blown traveler, sank from sight beneath the smothering bank, we piled with care our nightly stack of wood against the chimney back. The oaken log, green, huge, and thick, and on its top the stout back stick. The knotty forestick laid apart, and filled between with curious art the ragged brush. Then, hovering near, we watched the first red blaze appear, heard the sharp crackle, caught the gleam of whitewashed wall and sagging beam, until the old, rude-furnished room burst, flower-like, into rosy bloom. While, radiant with a mimic flame, outside the sparkling drift became, and through the bare, bowed lilac tree, our own warm hearth seemed blazing free. The crane and pendant trammels showed, the Turks' heads on the andirons glowed, while childish fancy, prompt to tell the meaning of the miracle, whispered the old rhyme. Under the tree, when fire outdoors burns merrily, there the witches are making tea. The moon above the eastern wood shone at its full. The hill range stood transfigured in the silver flood, its blown snows flashing cold and keen, dead white, save 
where some sharp ravine took shadow, or the somber green of hemlocks turned to pitchy black against the whiteness at their back. For such a world and such a night, most fitting that unwarming light, which only seemed where e'er it fell to make the coldness visible. Shut in from all the world without, we sat the clean-winged hearth about, content to let the north wind roar in baffled rage at pain and door, while the red logs before us beat the frost line back with tropic heat. And ever, when a louder blast shook beam and rafter, as it passed, the merrier up its roaring draught, the great throat of the chimney laughed. The house dog on his paws outspread, lay to the fire his drowsy head. The cat's dark silhouette on the wall, a couch in tigers seemed to fall. And for the winter fireside meet, between the end iron straddling feet, the mug of cider simmered slow, the apple sputtered in a row, and, close at hand, the basket stood with nuts from brown October's wood. What matter how the night behaved? What matter how the north wind raved? Blow high, blow low, not all its snow could quench our hearth's fire's ruddy glow. O oh, time and change, with hair as gray as was my sire's that winter day, how strange it seems, with so much gone, of life and love, to still live on. Ah, brother! Only I and thou are left of all that circle now, the dear home faces whereupon that fitful firelight paled and shone. Henceforward, listen as we will, the voices of that hearth are still. Look where we may, the wide earth o'er, those lighted faces smile no more. We tread the paths their feet have worn. We sit beneath their orchard trees. We hear, like them, the hum of bees and rustle of the bladed corn. We turn the pages that they read. Their written words we linger o'er. But in the sun they cast no shade. No voice is heard. No sign is made, no step is on the conscience floor. Yet love will dream and faith will trust, since he who knows our need is just, that somehow, somewhere, meet we must. Alas for him who never sees the stars shine through his cypress trees, who hopeless, lays his dead away, nor looks to see the breaking day across the mournful marbles play, who hath not learned in hours of faith the truth to flesh and sense unknown, that life is ever lord of death, and love can never lose its own. We sped the time with stories old, wrought puzzles out, and riddles told, or stammered from a schoolbook lore, the chief of Gambia's golden shore. How often since, when all the land was clay in slavery shaping hand, as if a far blown trumpet stirred the languorous sin sick air, I heard, Does not the voice of reason cry? Claim the first right which nature gave, 
from the red scourge of bondage to fly, nor deign to live a burdened slave? Our father rode again his ride on Memphamagog's wooded side, sat down again to moose and samp and trapper's hut in Indian camp, lived o'er the old idyllic ease beneath St. Francis' hemlock trees. Again for him the moonlight shone on Norman cap in bodiced zone. Again he heard the violin play which led the village dance away, and mingled in its merry whirl the grandam and the laughing girl. Or, nearer home, our steps he led, where Salisbury's level marshes spread, mile wide as fly the laden bee, where merry mowers, hale and strong, swept scythe on scythe, their swaths along the low green prairies of the sea. We shared the fishing off Boar's Head, and round the rocky isles of shoals, the hake boil on the driftwood coals, the chowder on the sand beach made, dipped by the hungry, steaming hot, with spoons of clamshell from the pot. We heard the tales of witchcraft old, in dream and sign and marvel told to sleepy listeners as they lay stretched idly on the salted hay adrift along the winding shores when favoring breezes deigned to blow the square sail of the gundalo and idle lay the useless oars our mother while she turned her wheel or run the new knit stocking hill, told how the Indian hordes came down at midnight on Concheco town, and how her own great uncle bore his cruel scalp mark to fourscore, recalling in her fitting phrase, so rich and picturesque and free, the common unrhymed poetry of simple life and country ways, the story of her early days. She made us welcome to her home. Old hearths grew wide to give us room. We stole with her a frightened look at the gray wizard's conjuring book. The fame whereof went far and wide through all the simple countryside. We heard the hawks at twilight play the boat horn on Piscataquay, the loon's weird laughter far away. We fished her little trout brook, knew what flowers in wood and meadows grew, what sunny hillside autumn brown she climbed to shake the ripe nuts down. So where in sheltered cove and bay the duck's black squadron anchored lay, and heard the wild geese calling loud, Beneath the gray November cloud. Then, haply, with a look more grave, In sober a tone, Some tale she gave from painful sea will's ancient tome, Beloved in every Quaker home, A faith fire-winged by martyrdom, Or Chalkley's journal, old and quaint, Gentlest of skippers, rare sea-saint, Who, when the dreary calms prevailed, and water butt and bread cask failed, and cool, hungry eyes pursued his portly presence, mad for food, with dark hints muttered under breath of casting lots for life or death, offered, if heaven withheld supplies, to be himself the sacrifice. Then, suddenly, as if to save the good man from his living grave, a ripple on the water grew, a school of porpoise flashed in view. Take, eat, he said, and be content. These fishes in my stead are sent 
by him who gave the tangled ram to spare the child of Abraham. Our uncle, innocent of books, was rich in lore of fields and brooks. The ancient teaches never dumb of nature's unhoused lyceum. In moons and tides and weather-wise, he read the clouds as prophecies, and foul affair could well divine by many an occult hint and sign, holding the cunning warded keys to all the woodcraft mysteries. Himself to nature's heart so near that all her voices in his ear of beast or bird had meanings clear, like Apollonius of old, who knew the tales the sparrows told, or Hermes, who interpreted what the sage cranes of Nilus said. A simple, guileless, childlike man, content to live where life began, strong only on his native grounds, the little world of sights and sounds, whose girdle was the parish bounds, whereof his fondly partial pride, the common features magnified, as Surrey hills to mountains grew, and white of Selborne's loving view. He told how tail and loon he shot, and how the eagle's eggs he got, the feats on pond and river done, the prodigies of rod and gun, till, warming with his tales he told, forgotten was the outside cold, the bitter wind unheeded blew. From ripening corn the pigeons flew, the partridge drummed in the woods, the mink went fishing down the river brink, in fields with bean or clover gay, the woodchuck, like a hermit gray, peered from the doorway of his cell. The muskrat plied the mason's trade, and tier by tier his mud walls laid, and from the shagbark overhead the grizzled squirrel dropped his shell. Next, the dear aunt whose smile of cheer and voice and dreams I see and hear. The sweetest woman ever fate perverse denied a household mate, who, lonely, homeless, not the less found peace in love's unselfishness, and welcome wheresoe'er she went, a calm and gracious element whose presence seemed the sweet income and womanly atmosphere of home. Called up her girlhood memories, the huskings and the apple bees, the sleigh rides and the summer sails, weaving through all the poor details and homespun warp of circumstance, a golden woof thread of romance. For, well she kept her genial mood in simple faith of maidenhood. Before her still a cloudland lay, the mirage loomed across her way. The morning dew that dries so soon with others glistened at her noon. Through years of toil and soil and care, from glossy tress to thin gray hair, all unprofane she held apart the virgin fancies of the heart. Be shame to him of woman born, who hath for such but thought of scorn. End of Part 1 Snowbound, A Winter Idol Recording by Paul Tremblay, Louisville, Kentucky.